Well, welcome to Show Me The Money Rugby League TV. You've got myself, Mick the Game Caller Gledel and Jimmy Mack. We're at the halfway stage in the Betfred Championship season and also at the halfway stage in the Betfred League One season. So we thought we'd give you a very, very special show where we're going to try and analyse and look at how the Championship uh, and League One uh, are currently shaping up to be because... It is round 15 this weekend, so we're just ever so slightly past the halfway point. And I think, Jimmy, when you look at the championship, no real shocks or surprises. Wakefield, Trinity, top of the table, 14 games in, 14 wins, 28 points, head and shoulders, a class above everybody else, despite a couple of close shaves on two occasions against Batley and a very tough away day for them against Widnes, where... They, they only just managed to uh, get over the line. Yeah. And at the bottom of the table, pretty much as we thought it would go with Mark Sawyer, obviously saying halfway through last season, he was going to lower the budget at Dewsbury, which of course triggered Liam Finn going to Halifax. Uh, and no real shocks or surprises to see Dewsbury Rams in that bottom position. Perhaps a bit of a shock that they've only had the one win, which was the round two win over, over Batley all those months ago, the fact that they've not been able to to back that up, but, you know, they pushed Doncaster all the way at the yeah, weekend in a, yeah. in a real tight, tense, tough game, perhaps. It might be a little too late for them, but if you take away Wakefield at the top, mm. you take away Dewsbury at the bottom, there is very, very little between Sheffield in second all the way down to Swinton in 13th. There's very, very little, as we've seen, a lot of shot results this season, yeah. You know, the championship, as I keep saying weekly on the radio uh, Sunday afternoon for those people who listen to me uh, religiously, you know, the unscripted drama, the competitiveness of the 24 uh, championship season, I've never known anything like it because on any given day, any side can go to any club and win. And we've seen that with 13th place Winton going to third place to lose early on in the season. Yeah and getting that shock win. We've seen Bradford, we've seen Sheffield slip up against opposition who they would have been heavily fancied to pick up those points. So everybody is, is well and truly... Barrow yeah, probably one of Yeah, Barrow, of course, beating Featherstone. The list is endless. Um, you know, give us your thoughts on, on where we are in the season. Yeah, well, I think you've summed it up perfectly so far. I don't think, I don't think we're surprised at how tight it is. You know, when we did our predictions... Um, before the season started, we kind of we were reluctant to say, you know, too much, too harsh about Dewsbury, but I think we all had him probably finishing at the bottom. We're hoping that they've still got a couple more wins in them. That Donny one slipped away at the weekend. I'm sure they will get you know another win or two, just because, like you say, on certain days anybody can beat anybody within reason. Um, fair play to Wakefield first and foremost. I suppose the only question about Wakefield is, will they slip up or are they so motivated? And being full-time, we know how big an advantage it is. And I think being full-time for them and having that extra extra drive and determination that this is all preparation for being back in the big time next year, I think everybody agrees that Wakey will be back in Super League. So it's not just a case of let's try and win the league and let's try and dominate. It's a case of let's start our journey now for being as best placed as possible for going back into Super League. And that, that started, I believe, at the start of this season. You know, everything we've done so far is, is they've set goals for this year, but really every goal they set should be very achievable. And from the outside looking in, they should achieve those goals. Win the 89.5 Cup, come top, win the final, and perhaps even go unbeaten, you know, and that's not easy to do, but no one's going to be shocked if they do that. So I think a lot of what they're doing is is with one eye on next year. Uh, outside of that, we've got a great battle for the, the player places again, haven't we? I think we're both on the same page about Widness got off to a bit of a flyer, arguably overachieved a little bit. I don't think either of us put them in the playoffs at the start of the year. I think we had them just missing out. Yeah. Um, but with such a great start, you know, they've put themselves with every chance of keeping hold of the playoff spot. Halifax and York with the two teams with a very slow start, and you'd argue York have, have now come out of that, and Halifax 
Halifax are really waiting for the fixtures to allow them to get out of it. And I think that's the, the scary thing for Halifax is I think their first half of the season on paper was a bit easier than the second half of the season. York have had a few games in a row now where they can go bam, bam, bang. If they didn't, if they didn't do bad against Sheffield the other week, if they could have been looking at three, four, five wins in a row. Whereas Halifax just can't have, they've just not had those fixtures come where which are very winnable games. And I'm and I'm sure they will pick up enough wins that they don't get dragged in. So probably the most exciting for the neutrals is who's gonna come, you know, let's say Jewsbury sadly are are probably gonna come bottom. That third from bottom going into a game playing the winner of the League One playoffs. Which I believe will be Oldham or Keefley. Well, I think yeah. You you you'd expect it will be either and and probably Oldham will win League One. Keithley have to beat them twice, don't they? And not slip up again. So they've got a challenge to get automatic and we'll get onto that a bit later. But there's gonna be so much pressure in, in that game. Whoever comes third from bottom of the championship, which could easily be one of five or six teams still one game to decide whether you stay in the championship or get knocked down to League One, or for the League One team, get out of League One. And we know as the, as the years go by and the number of teams in the championship becomes less, it's got to be really hard to get back up, isn't it? So there's so much to play for every single week. There's been more shocks than I expected, even though we thought it would be a really competitive, close league. I didn't anticipate so many upsets, but it only takes a few injuries here and there, and, and, and anything's possible, isn't it? And let's be honest, Fev have had an absolute nightmare. We knew they were going to have a tough season with all their changes, uh, and then they've had injury problems and bans. They've got some more bans coming up this weekend, which makes Halifax and Fev this weekend in a really interesting game. York City Knights had another nightmare start with loads of injuries, very similar to last year, which had an awful lot to do with Hendo being moved upstairs and away from the coaching role because, you know, poor Hendo couldn't do much more with a with number of injuries he was, he was having to deal with every week. Now they get players back and all of a sudden, bam, bam, bang. Halifax have had a bit of a nightmare with lots of mm. things going on off the field and, and they've suffered as a result. Whereas Witness, hardly any injuries, bang, straight up there. Sheffield, massive squad, quality squad, the best squad in the league for me, outside of Wakefield, and to be fair, it's not that far off Wakefield, but Wakefield have got you know the, the full time side of things. So no surprise they're sat in second because they can afford to have a couple of injuries. It can afford to change the team around on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Whereas other teams like Batley with a, a much smaller squad, no one wants to play Batley at full strength, but you take four players out of the Batley team and anyone will think we can beat them. You know, and that's how delicately poised it is. When you look at York, and we'll just focus on York a little bit to to start off with, Jimmy, obviously, a lot of people might say, did Andrew Henderson get the best out of his side? You know, we've seen Mark Applegarf come in and I watched their game late last night, you know, the full match against Barron. I I was really impressed with with what York Mm. are serving up now. Mm. And I think that should be a bit of a warning sign to Sheffield, to Bradford, to Toulouse. You know, they are literally... Uh, a game behind behind Featherstone yeah. and two games behind Witness to, to enter in the playoffs for the first time this year. And, you know, we use that word repetition and, and familiarity. And, and, and this will all be deja vu for those York City Knights players because they were in exactly in this same position this time last year. People were looking at the table and thinking, hang on a second, they're only two points off, you know, the bottom two. And, mm. and that was the case the other week. But all of a sudden now the... That narrow defeat at the LNER to Sheffield, yeah. 18 points to 10, a very good, tough performance. The show in the hand, and I think Mark Applegarth's side, they're only going to um, get better and stronger as the season goes. And I think if you are going to look for um, a dark horse, I know I said Doncaster were, were always going to be my dark horse. Yeah. And they are a point behind Featherstone as things stand. And, yeah. you know, Doncaster, nobody wants to play them when they're switched on. But I'm kind of changing my tune a little bit. I still think York are going to just sneak in 
at, at the end. And, you know, mm. like you say, Jimmy, that they had all that injury adversity at the start of the season. Now that subs- that's subsided and Mark Applegarth can, can get the best out of his side. Um, yeah, for the second half of the season, my, my tip, my danger tip, and I wanted to get York out of the way. You know, they're the dark horses for mine who who Wakefield, Bradford, Sheffield need to be watching out for. Yeah, totally. And and, and I can't call them a dark horse because I think I, I, I certainly thought they'd be in the playoffs this year. I thought the, the fortune they had last year with injuries mm. was, was so freakishly bad, surely they couldn't have it again. And for, for most of this first half of the year, they've had exactly the same, if not worse. I still think they'll get in the playoffs. I expect them to get in the playoffs, uh, probably the, at the expense of Widnes or even Fev, you know, because Fev seems to be getting into some rotten luck at the moment. So I, I think Fev, I think York will get in the playoffs, and I think they'll probably be the team a bit like London last year, where yeah. people are, we don't want to play them. Yeah, we yeah. really don't want to play York. When Aten Garner's on it, he's as good as any half in the division and many in the division above. That's how highly I rate him. And then you know, well, their their roster is superb. You know, as, as simple as that. So. I'm glad to see them getting back to where where I, I expected them to be. And and I do like to see York do well because I do think they're a club which are good for the game. Mm. They're good for the big... It's a lovely away day or home, home day if you're a York fan. And that stadium and, and being in York and all that, I think it... You know, I do like to see them do well. Um, and I think they, they will sneak in there, I'm sure. Just on Featherstone, we know Deck Patton's now been banned for six. six games. So that takes him right up to Featherstone's visit to what Barra Cardinals against Bradford. Is it? No surprise Ben Reynolds has found himself coming back from Wilkinson Rovers to Featherstone. Yeah. We know Paul Turner's currently out. We know Thomas Lacans yeah. is out for, for the for the season. For the season. So James Ford, one win in six. We know that they had a big win. 60 point win over Whitehaven mm. uh, at home at the weekend. They've got that very tough game coming up this weekend at the Shea against Halifax, who yeah. are, are in their own sort of mini mess, so yes. to speak. But if you were going to pick one current championship club currently in the playoffs who probably has a question mark, I know you've mentioned Witness, and I still have my doubts whether or not Witness can mm. maintain that early season momentum certainly after I think it's now four straight defeats on the bounce but I just think when you actually look at Featherstone and the um, adversity that they're facing in their spine positions Mm. I think James Ford probably has the toughest job of of those current top six sides to try and preserve and maintain Featherstone's presence in the the top six at season's end Mm. well I'll go I still think I expect Fed to finish above witness um if if we were sat here now not knowing that um, Reynolds was going back and and they've already they were in a pickle with half backs a few weeks ago. They managed to get Deck Patton out of Swinton and you think Deck on a good day is as good as anyone. Yes. Deck on a bad day is probably worse yes. than anybody else yeah. in any position in any team. You know, that's how extreme he is from one extreme to the other, in my opinion. So he goes into Fev and you think, right, all Ford needs to do is get a good half a season out of him, which is exactly what Kilshaw got out of him in the first half. And Fev will definitely be in the playoffs. Whereas they lose him, now he's got Reynolds back. I still think, well, they'll probably be fine because they've still got some seriously good players. And they have got a decent amount of debt. And they've still got the relationship with Hull KR. Whereas Widness are now starting to hit a few injuries. And I don't think they've got the same depth and support from, from outside. And, I, and I, as a result, I think they're going to be, if, if they don't hold on to it, and York are to be the team that sneak in, then um, I think it will be at Winnes' expense rather than Feb's. So you're thinking it's going to be the Chemex, the black and whites, who might just miss out and suffer some uh, playoff heartbreak? I think so. Yeah, but I don't know, because like we say, you just, and witness are a bit like, a bit like Sheffield in the sense that having your home games on a 4G is a, a real advantage, mm. you know, because it, it's such a different paced game and a different style of play. However, we talk about Bradford's home advantage at Oddsville, I think that's his bigger advantage as, as Sheffield on the 4G, 
I think Barrow and Whitehaven's home advantage because of a travel is as big an advantage as, as that. Batley on the slope, on the slope, mm-hmm. you know, the, there's probably only. I'd say Toulouse have the home advantage. They've got the largest oh, totally. playing surface in the championship. Totally, and everyone's got to travel. And the only thing that's changed with Toulouse a bit is that teams have probably started to believe they can go over there and get result more. But Toulouse have stepped it up a gear over the last five, six weeks as well. It's probably, and this is one thing I've said all year, I, f- I don't feel sorry for Donny because they're very fortunate they're playing a lovely stadium on, an, on a lovely surface, as do York. But they're probably two clubs where the home advantage isn't as significant because it's a lovely surface. The stadiums are great. The changing rooms are great. There's no travel involved for the away teams. And actually, that makes them a little bit more vulnerable. It's not like going to, to play in the San Siro with 80,000 fans against you as well. There's, there's a, what, 1,500, 2,000 fans there. It's not going to make a player have an absolute nightmare because of the pressure and abuse mm. from the stadium. It's actually quite a nice away day, and and that's why I, you know Donny have done well so far. But I don't think they'll hang on to seventh spot. I think they'll they'll drop down, and they could easily get dragged into that fight for the to avoid third from bottom. When I spoke to Richard Horn at the Championship season launch, he said that their number one goal, um, and it was it was quite a, a a realistic statement from from Richard Horn. It is to survive. Yeah. You know, first and foremost, without talking about the signings that they've made, and I think deep down, Carl Hall and Richard Horn will be absolutely delighted that they're in seventh, a point behind Featherstone, mm-hmm. uh, and knocking on, on the door of Wigness and Featherstone to get into the six. But, yeah. you know, ultimately and fundamentally, their goal was because when they were last in the championship, they were in a season and they were straight back out. And then it took them so long to get back to the promised line. Yeah. 90 seasons, I think it was. Um, since they were last in there in 2015. So, you know, I think they would absolutely snap your hand off right here, right now for for championship survival for next year. But one thing you'll have noticed as well as me, Jimmy, is from Doncaster in seventh all the way down to Swinton in 13th, there is less than three games between uh, eight teams. Three points. Three points, yeah, yeah, yeah. between all those teams. And they've all got to obviously play each other. And they've all got to play each other. And you made a very good point about Halifax, Halifax, they've got another tough fixture this weekend. Last week they had Sheffield away. Never an easy place to to go and, and, and get a performance. Um, and I wouldn't quite say this Featherston game is the must win, but they do have a game against Whitehaven coming up the week after. around the corner. Yeah. And they do have a game against Batley coming up. Yeah. And those, for mine, are those must win yeah. games for Liam Fink. Yeah. I would probably argue and say this game against Featherston, as they return to the Shea, because obviously they played a couple of games at Wakefield due to the Shea mm-hmm. uh, playing surface being redeveloped and re I probably, I wouldn't, I, I, maybe saying this weekend's games are free here is, is, is wrong, but. Because of where Halifax are and because of the predicament they face, and this is the same situation that obviously Swinton and Barrow and Whitehaven are facing, they're now having to look, because we're in the sort of final sort of third of the season or heading towards yeah. the final third of the season, you are going to be, Johnny Gawley, Paul Carey, they're going to be they're going to be highlighting those well, games against well. each other. If we win that, we survive. Four, four pointers everywhere. Four pointers. Yeah. And I think that is what Halifax and, and Liam Fink um, will we'll probably do. Do I expect Halifax to be in the bottom two? No. But because of how tight it is, you can't say that Halifax or Doncaster um, or Barrow or any of those right. mid-table clubs or even Wigness, if they keep this yeah. downward trajectory, could bad. not end up in that 12th spot, which yeah. obviously means a playoff game, winner takes all for championship or for a league one point of view. Promotion to the championship, but totally. Ooh. And I think, and you know, you look at Batley again. Right? Now, early on in the season, Jewsbury picked up a win against Batley. Jewsbury were very good that day, but Batley were a few out. And now Batley are getting help from Castleford, and Luke Hooley is practically a Batley player again. And they're getting Sammy Kabula's now a Batley player again, and they're now a bit more like the Batley of last year. Yes. Who, and no surprise, they're starting to pick up wins and and running running everybody close, even if they're not winning. So they're, they're not a, a, a team that anyone will be looking at now. Certainly not away. No one's looking at Batley Way going, here we go. Yeah. Four, as, four as, point, as Bradford right? and Sheffield found out. On yeah, Bradford and weekends. Sheffield. Yeah, and that, and that chain, and, you know, it's, it is, it's so tight. And, and, and ultimately, like you said, there's probably six teams in that division now 
where if you said to the coach and the CEO, you can have four from bottom now guaranteed and but kiss goodbye to getting in the playoffs. So, I think yeah. all six had snap run off. Yeah. Doncaster certainly would. That's their object to stay up. Halifax would now for relief because it's been such a turbulent, turbulent year so far. Barrow definitely would. Whitehaven definitely would. You know, Batley would. You know, rather than try and get him a playoffs, because ultimately, what are you playing for? Because Wakefield will be starting on a, a minus 20, minus 30 handicap in the final anyway. And we know that they're the only team who can go up slash are going up. So Sheffield are playing for pride. Toulouse are playing for IMG points. You know, Bradford playing for IMG points. And, and Sheffield will be to an extent. But really, they're just wanting to be the best team other than Wakey. You know, so it, it's much more important to, to escape third from bottom than it is to, to get that sixth spot. Because sadly, as Sheffield showed at Wembley, who I believe are the second best team in the, in the division, you can't compete with Wakey. Not when Wakey are really up for it and on it. You know, can Batley catch Wakey a little bit at their place when some players like off? Maybe. But when Wakey are on it and really up for it, which the, the, the top teams in the champ are finding because Wakey are turning up to play them and probably thinking, right, let's really knuckle down today. Let's find an extra gear. So do you think Wakey will slip up? I think if Wakefield are going to slip up, they probably slip up either this weekend against Bradford at Bardacard Hudson or away to Toulouse the week after. Mm. Um, I know Bradford have a couple of injury concerns going into this weekend's game against Wakefield, but then Wakefield have obviously lost Liam Hood, Mason Lino, mm. Miles Lawford. So they've got a lot of disruption yeah. and, and reshuffling of the spine. And I'm led to believe that is why they were trailing at halftime against Batley on Sunday because it needed Daryl Powell's halftime team talk to, to change Redirect. things and freshen things up. Yeah, and, and you know, no surprise, Wakefield in that second half against Batley some early tries after half time and before you know it that 22 points uh, before the hour mark 30 points to 12 it's it's game over yeah. but if, I thought if we were going to slip up it was probably after the final yes and that was um, witness witness but and they somehow did. somehow and managed witness up, yeah. were, were riding a crest yeah um, so yeah no I, I, I expect him to go unbeaten um, but definitely should do mm -hmm. I don't I know you could say it's ridiculous to expect that but I think if they don't go and beat then they'll all be disappointed and rightly so. Well, let's just look at three clubs then who, in my opinion, are the challengers to Wakefield. We've not discussed these yet. We'll start with second place Sheffield Eagles. Um, probably two shock defeats, um, in maybe in your eyes, Jimmy, was the defeat to Batley. That was the week leading up to the game against Wembley. And yeah. a game where they didn't simply turn up was the game at Bader Card Hudson where Bradford, not for the first time in recent seasons against Sheffield, blitzed them early. Yeah. Before you know it, it's 20 points to six Too and there was no time. way back. And, and Bradford, in the end, had a very comfortable, uh, convincing win. The shown very similar to Bradford and Toulouse in their games against Wakefield this season, that they can compete with Wakefield, certainly in the league, in that 36-18 defeat at Olympic, Olympic Legacy Park mm. for a good hour, a good 60 minutes, there was very little between Sheffield and Wakefield. It was only them bookends yeah. of the half where that full-time status and, you know, yeah. that superior fitness levels where, where Wakefield scored those 18 points. And that was very similar to Wakefield's big win against Bradford in the 1895 Cup semi-final where they scored 24 points in the last 10 minutes of the first half and the last 10 minutes of the second half. You take them fine. I know it's the challenge for Bradford, the challenge for Sheffield, the challenge for Toulouse is to match Wakefield for 80 minutes. But mm. if you take away the 10 minutes, the scoreboard's pretty much level elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that's that's exactly where they are and that's the benefit of the full time, isn't it? But I think, look, going into the season, Sheffield, like I said, have that depth. They can... They've not really had many injury problems. They've not had many um, bans. And they've been able to rotate a little bit as well. I think one thing Sheffield have done this year, which they hadn't done in the last couple of years as they've been rising up, is probably realising how much rotation they need to do to make sure you're still flying at the end of the year. 
Sheffield have only got one challenge this year for me, and that's to get this next third of the season correct and to be flying when it comes to the playoffs. They will want to be in that grand final with Wakey and have another go at it. And anything else behind closed doors will probably be a bit of a disappointment. If they tail off again at the end of this year like they did last year, they'll be they'll be scratching their heads mm. and they'll be disappointed because they their main focus is to be make sure we we're ready for that back end of the year. Um so no surprises where they are. I think the last few weeks has been awesome. Since since the final, to not drop off after the final. We saw what happened to Halifax last year. Albeit they did and, win it, and Batley, know. Batley as well, who were Bat- the, Batley, the losing who were the losers. It's so either team in that final. And then the wins they've picked up over over that period has been, you know, really impressive to sustain their position at, at second in the table. And then obviously it's a three point gap now behind you know, to loose and, and Bradford, Bradford who, level who played out the draw. I don't think team. I don't think that either of those teams will catch Sheffield now. You think Sheffield? I think they'll hang on. Yeah, it, it, obviously they can, and it's going to be a massive game at the OLP when Bradford goes down because that's a four pointer. I do expect Toulouse will probably beat Sheffield at Toulouse, uh, but if if they don't, and if Sheffield go to Toulouse and get a win, they deserve second spot, don't they? So they need to get revenge on Bradford to prove that they are the, the next best team. But it's going as well as they would have hoped so far. And but like I say. As far as they're concerned, the big test is probably this last third and not to fall into the trap of, of last year. Well, that leaves then the two sides in third and, and fourth, which is Toulouse and Bradford, two sides who I call the IMG Giants because rightly so, they are currently in the, the top 14 um, of the indicative gradings. Toulouse, as we've just done on the full 80 minutes, they're actually ahead of Castleford and Bradford mm. currently based on, on last, last season. season yeah. So Toulouse, you know, Sylvan Houlis and Cedric Garcia, who I spoke to at the weekend in the south of France, you know, it's now or never for them. Sylvan Houlis pointed it out, they need to go up this season or he doesn't believe they will ever go up because because of their position and when they were in the Super League in 22, that is counted this season. That will drop off after next season and the big crowds that they got in the Super League season. And let's not forget, average league position is over three years. That's the same for average attendances. Toulouse, they've had, had too many crowds over three and a half thousand this year. So, oh, Sylvan Hulis yeah. is absolutely spot on. Yeah. It is now or never for Toulouse. And I guess the argument uh, or, or the debate is going to be, have Toulouse improved on their 12.98? We know Castleford are in the 13s, maybe even the 14s. We know Bradford are in the middle 13s. Bradford are obviously going to improve. We know Wakefield have improved so much so that we can say with strong conviction on here that we genuinely believe Wakefield will be in the Super League next year and they will replace London. But as for Toulouse, Bradford, Castleford, it's still, it's it's not black and white. It's it's very grey and and monochroming because no one genuinely knows where each club is, but... Can you understand why Sylvan's perhaps totally, yeah. putting a bit more pressure or has a bit more pressure on his shoulders? Because he obviously needs to lose to be finishing second. He needs to lose to be in that million pound game for to lose his chances and realistic hopes of a Super League place in 25. Yeah, absolutely. And and the way they started the year, I thought, I didn't know whether to think they have been told or they believe they will be in Super League and they're just taking it easy. But then, you know, they've started to power up. I don't think, wait, what Wake you've done in the last, what, six, nine months has gone from so low to so high. Yeah. If Toulouse weren't expecting that, thinking we're a shoo-in, they might have thought, well, we'll just cruise for a year and then we'll, you know, reload when we get back into Super League. And now everything's up in the air a lot more and they can only do so much. Um, and they've still every chance of getting second and they still every chance of having a good go at Wakey in a one-off game, but I don't believe they've got the quality to take on Wakey any more so than Bradford at full strength or, or Sheffield at full strength, even Fev at full strength. Um, so, yeah, I kind of feel that Toulouse need it to go to 14 now and and like a few other clubs do. Um, and, and can they survive financially or were they, were they you know, really relying on getting back into the big time in 2025? And, um, 
that's where they're at. I mean, one Achilles heel I will say about Toulouse is they've had 15 players in the sim bin this season. Yeah. Their real discipline is, yeah. is atrocious. Yeah. And, you know, the weekend gone, the t- fantastic championship game, 12 all draw with Bradford. Bradford's, a, we're going to move on to them next, but Bradford's ill discipline is still a worrying factor for mine. They're up to 11 players in the sim bin mm. and Aribi Doro, who was sent off for headbutting um, against Barrow but that is Toulouse's Achilles heel yeah they, definitely they, the, the amount of penalties and set restarts Ooh. they concede yeah. because they like to play on the edge and they like to be tough they like to be aggressive and Sylvan has said that you know but he wants them to stay on the right side of that he doesn't want them to be crossing that and being dirty as we are seeing they are constantly getting hammered in the penalty count and um, that has obviously you know impacted and influenced some of their mm. results but Moving on to Bradford, currently fourth. Logan Bayliss, the new Australian, he was the 39th player of Eamon O'Carroll's season to wow. make his wow. appearance. I that remember is a lot saying- of players. That is a lot of players, Jimmy. And, and we're just past the halfway point. And I, I'll say this as a, as, 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 as a, you know, I work for the club. I do the commentaries on the radio, covering the club extensively. There's a lot of mitigation. Bradford have had, in my opinion, along with York and Halifax, Mm. they have had by far the worst injury adversity of any championship side in this current season. The fact that they've only been able to play Tom Holmes, Lee Gaskell and Jordan Lilly in the halves, your first choice starting spine for just two games out of 20, Mm. if we include 1895 and Challenge Cup, that just shows you how much pressure and reshuffling Eamon O'Carroll has, has, has had because Jordan Lilly, he should be partnering Lee Gaskell, but no, he's had Billy Jowett there, he's had Tyra Not, he's had John Davis there. Yeah, John Davis. You know, he's had Tom Holmes there. Yeah. He's had six different and halfback it, partners. But I'm sure I remember last year us commenting on how many players Bradford had used and, and that a lot of that was to do with um, the dual reg with Leeds, wasn't there? There was a lot of unrest there and difference of opinions on, on how much should Bradford use it and was it right to use it where you've not really had that this year obviously Leeds are paired up with Halifax but there's been and different from last year there's been this constant clearly trying to strengthen and get more and like we touched upon in the other show Bradford obviously believe that that Super League dream is on the horizon 100%. And, and maybe not next year but maybe the year after and it's very important what they do now to make sure they're in the best position if the league does expand in 2026. And and, and for me, I think that Bradford have got, like I touched on before, a very clear objective for this year and next year, and it's all about IMG points. Everything they've done off the field for the last 18 months, you know, some things we've discussed before, attendances and things like that. Let's Let's say Bradford have really put an effort in to getting big attendances. Let's say that. So they've been getting really good attendances now for a while, which gets them extra points. They've got the screen. They're doing certain things, which is clever and needs to be done to get them points. Whereas other teams are probably in this division are fighting and trying to finish as high as they can. And the lads are fighting to pick up their £200 win pay every week. Bradford are fighting for every little point and every little advantage they can get to get themselves in the best position for 2026. Because if it goes to 14 and they get it right, they've got as good a chance as as anybody else fighting for a spot. But if they slip up and finish seventh this year, that alone could scupper it off. Well, Jimmy Mack has just uh, deserted us. Uh, No secret, James Ford has been phoning Craig, Joe and Jimmy uh, relentlessly. So if you're watching this, James, um, he's, he's just picked up the phone to you now. So clearly Featherstone are putting an order in for some show me the money players. But we were just talking about, obviously, the raised expectations and the importance of a high place finish for those IMG giants of Toulouse and Bradford. Realistically, when you look at the indicative grades that were released last season, at the end of last season, Toulouse on 12.98, Bradford on 12.02, and then between 14th place Bradford and 15th place Featherstone, there's nearly a two-point gap. So Jimmy is quite right, Super League in 26, if it does go as everybody expects it to do, to go to 14 teams, Bradford and Toulouse are in the driving seat to return to the Super League. But what I would say is, 
whilst everything isn't black and everything isn't white and it's grey and monochrome, Bradford and Toulouse certainly still have a very, very good realistic chance of being in the top tier for next season, as we've seen with Castleford in the Super League. Less emphasis on on-field performance. It's all been about doing up Weldon Road, putting the seats on the terracing so they meet minimum standards in terms of covered seats and the improvements that they've made at their ground to the hospitality areas and, of course, the insta- inst- installation of a, a big screen, very much similar to what Bradford are doing at Bada Card Odsall with the new director's lounge, the new supporters bar, the improved facilities, the extension that is going to take place to the gantry. And of course, Bradford, of course, putting um, a big screen in um, on, the, on the away terracing. But certainly it's going to be an interesting end to the championship season because Bradford know the higher they finish, the more IMG points they will accumulate based on performance. And that is the same of Sylvan Hooley, Cedric Garcia uh, and everybody at Toulouse. But one thing that me and Jimmy have, have discussed on this very special uh, Show Me The Money Rugby League TV championship show is that on any given day, anyone can just about beat anyone, as we saw at the weekend. You know, Widness there looking to cement their place in the top five. Swinton were in the relegation spots. Um, and, and look what happened there, 24 points to 12. Um, obviously, Swinton capitalising on a, a couple of uh, injuries to those witness players. But certainly, as this weekend's games are about to hit us, Whitehaven hosting Toulouse, for instance, John Igorley, I'm sure he will be heartened by Bradford's performance against Toulouse, and perhaps that may lay, lay a few pointers for him. Um, obviously, you know, Widness, they've got a home game against Dewsbury, so you would expect Alan Coleman and Widness to arrest the slump or the mini slump with those consecutive defeats. Halifax against Featherstone for different reasons. You know, there's a lot of pressure on Liam Finn at the moment and a lot of pressure still on James Ford, despite, you know, a good win for Halifax the previous weekend over Whitehaven at their temporary home whilst they were using Wakefield. And of course, Featherstone putting 60 points on Whitehaven at the weekend. That's really an interesting game. And obviously you've got Wakefield currently top of the table, host uh, away to fourth place Bradford. There's some really exciting games taking place this weekend. Um, And who knows, as I said earlier, I think Wakefield will at least slip up at one point this season, whether it's this weekend at Odsall, who knows, but they've certainly got a tough trip to to lose to come. But head and shoulders above the rest of Wakefield Trinity um, and, you know, Daryl Powell, and Matt Ellis and everybody involved in the Wakefield Club deserves a huge pat on the back and a lot of praise for that investment and that belief in ensuring that Wakefield more than likely will be the team that replaced London in the Super League next year. Well, look, we've done a bit of a championship show. I know we said we were going to do League One. We're going to leave League One for a week or two. Um, But yes, when we all get back together, we will do another championship show and we will do another League One show. But uh, if you're asking me right here, right now, as we head towards round 15, who will be the top six at season end and who will be the sides that go down? You're putting me on the spot. So we're going to go first, which I genuinely believe will be Wakefield. No one's going to catch Wakefield. Wakefield may go undefeated and it will be the strongest championship season by any side outside of the top flight in history if Wakefield were to do that. I I know Jimmy's gone with Sheffield in second. I still think Toulouse will sneak second. I've got Bradford in third. I've got Sheffield in fourth. I have then got the York Knights in fifth. And I can't make my mind up at this moment in time whether or not it will be Widnes or Featherston. So there we go. And the teams to go down sadly will be Dewsbury and I think Barrow will just get dragged in. I'm sorry, Paul Carey. I'm sorry to the Barrow Raiders fans. I just think Barrow will get dragged in. Hopefully, I'm wrong. I enjoy trips up to Cumbria and, of course, Caravan Park. But no, thank you for joining us. Bit of a championship review of where the season's at. We'll do another one shortly. Thanks for watching.